Um, thank you, Ray, for that very kind introduction. Um, honored to be here, surrounded by innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, always uh, energized by the great thinking and creativity that comes out of um, all of you. So very honored. And being an entrepreneur myself, I can totally uh, be empathetic to everything you go on on a daily basis. There's, um, it's truly like a roller coaster, right? There's highs and there's lows and there's like, what the heck? <laughs> so um, it's truly, again, an honor being here. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, started out as a programmer. Wanted to do something in nuclear physics, um, but there was not a whole lot of stuff. My specialization is in nuclear medicine and uh, um, isotope technology. And there was not a whole lot of um, that going on in Denver when I moved here in 96. So I'm like, what should I do? Um, I was um, thinking, and then I'm like, it's a natural progression to computer science, you know, the same background, right? Logical thinking, problem solving. Um, I talked to my husband, and we said, OK, let's try a career in IT. And he was a very established leader in IT already. And I was like, maybe he can help me. So. Um, the two of us uh, started off in this IT thing, and um, my, hus my husband and I co-founded this consulting firm a um, couple of years into my career. And I'm like, I'm so new to the IT world, and he is this very driven, type A++ personality, and like the two of us getting into business together, this will be very interesting. <laughs> um, but the two of us started um, a consulting firm, again, a couple of years into my career, and it started out with a vision, uh, a very small you know, firm. It started out with one person. And the two of us worked relentlessly, relentlessly and it grew into a 65-plus employee organization within a year. We were both in our early 20s. Um, he in his late 20s, but. <laughs> um, and we had our very first multi-million dollar business before the age of 30. It was hard work, it was sweat, it was a lot of sleepless nights. But the one thing that I admire about my husband was again, he didn't, we didn't want to pursue a path of money. The money was a byproduct. It was all about chasing a vision. We wanted to make an impact. We were very passionate about technology. We were very passionate about having um, a lot of employees um, that came together, right? And it, it was a family. Um, so again, being an entrepreneur is the best thing that happened to me. Um, you learn to think like an owner. You learn to think frugally, right? Um, you can go on first class everywhere. <laughs> so it, it gets in, ingrained into your uh, system. So being an entrepreneur, it, it was a blessing. Um, it helped me take a lot of risks with my career, too, because that foundation helped me um, understand I can do anything. So um, I would love to go on and on and on about this again. We had operations in um, 10 different cities um, in the CRM um, uh, predictive analytics at that time, which was Siebel, in that area. And we were able to achieve some breakthrough successes with our firms. Like, again, uh, we competed with um, PwC, the big, big five consulting firms at that time, uh, Arthur Anderson. Uh, and th the thing that stood out for our clients it was our sincerity. They knew that we were not going to oversell them things that they didn't need, right? So that kind of um, ethical being upright about the business, that's the bottom line. People, you know, again, it was a struggle. I'm not saying it's a piece of cake. But what, um, for us, at the end of the day, we were successful doing the right thing. And I would love for all the entrepreneurs, I, I know there's going to be um, some very difficult times when you just were like, you know, let me just give it up right now, or let me do something else, right? But don't give up. If you chase your vision and if you're passionate about your product or your services or whatever, clients will see through that. And it all starts with one client. And then it, it's hopefully an upward, um, upward journey at that time, right? 
So um, very, very uh, proud of that journey of mine. So again, as I said, um, in 2014 of this year, I was appointed uh, the Secretary of Technology and Chief Informa Information Officer for the state of Colorado. And I'm a cabinet member on, uh, under Go Governor Hickenlooper's uh, administration. And it's been an honor serving with um, that administration. And again, their passion around homelessness, their passion around making government services effective, efficient, elegant, that's what attracted me to the public sector. Um, my dad was in the public sector for a very long time back in India. And um, when I got an opportunity to move into the public sector, I immediately said, yes, this is absolutely the right thing for me. So in my role at the uh, Governor's Office of Information uh, Technology, I have two roles. One is the CIO, which is the day-to-day -day operations of running the technology for 28,000 employees of the state. And it's not an easy job. Um, and then as the Secretary of Technology, uh, where I work with the Office of Economic Development and through public-private partnerships, making Colorado the number one state for businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, innovation, right? Who has seen the latest Forbes uh, article, fifth greatest state for entrepreneurs and innovation and businesses? Awesome. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> The governor is extremely passionate about it. Um, he thinks like a technologist, which is awesome, right? And that's why uh, mine, I think it's one of the very few states within the nation where the CIO is at the table making strategic de decisions and not just taking an order and saying, OK, I'll get that done for you, right? Um, so that's how much technology is valued in this um, uh, state. And I'm very proud to be part of that, right? So as um, the CIO. My team is around 900 employees, and we are in 70 different locations. Uh, a lot of my team is in, um, embedded within the agencies we serve, Department of Transportation, Natural Resources, uh, Parks and Wildlife. Um, it's, it's truly like supporting 20 different businesses, extremely disparate systems, right? And from an innovation perspective, we have the greatest foundational pieces already laid in terms of our complete office uh, productivity suite and collaboration suite is a Google platform. When I moved from the private sector, it was like government slow, you know, not at all. We are truly doing extremely innovative things. Um, on our big, uh, we are doing a lot, especially if there's any technologists in the room, a lot in the big data platform already. Uh, we have what's called a Colorado Information Marketplace where we serve uh, the citizens with putting out data from all the agencies that are important to the citizens. 500 different data sets that are accessed almost half a million hits to that website, right? Um, and that actually, we help take that data. And we have what's called, uh, what's called Go Code Colorado and um, several hackathons that help us bring the young entrepreneurs and uh, creative thinkers to come and help resolve government challenges. How do we coordinate natural disasters? We use it with uh, our Google sites um, and the data that comes out of this Colorado Information Marketplace. Amazing levels of innovation just within that space. Um, in September of last year, we had historic flooding within Colorado. So we stood up uh, OIT within a matter of 24 hours, uh, a, a forum called coloradounited.com which coordinated efforts across the uh, state within 24 to 48 hours <coughs> using Google platforms again. So our impact with technology is truly citizen facing. And that to me is what's impactful work, right? It's not about technology for the sake of technology's sake, but everything we do impacts a citizen in, in a positive way. With our predictive analytics, uh, we created a very robust platform for Medicaid, Medicare uh, eligibility, where we cut down processing times from 45 days to 45 minutes. How more innovative can we get, right? Um, and this is all happening in the public sector space where we don't have the resources like in the private sector. So it's um, very proud to be part of that momentum and that innovation and, and trying to help citizens get the best services that they deserve. So, um, and then in the mobile space, if any of you are in the mobile application area, 
we have a very robust platform where we um, get uh, real-time updates from Department of Transportation and construction updates onto your mobile phone. So this is the innovation that even private sector uh, companies are lagging behind sometimes. And um, especially the government in Colorado, we are truly taking innovation extremely seriously. Um, and as the Secretary of Technology, for me, the public-private partnerships are extremely uh, important. So we have, again, a tie-up with Thai Rockies, a great organization, uh, knew about it, global, uh, Thai, Thai Global, back in India itself, uh, very, uh, reputable organization that wants to make a difference. Uh, along with Thai, we have, again, various partnerships with Colorado Technology Association. Uh, they had their conference last night. Amazing set of people who are passionate about technology. Uh, COIN, which is actually a governor's initiative where uh, we bring innovation from across um, the world. So we had um, delegates from Israel, delegates from um, uh, a few European countries come and talk about how we can partner on a global level um, and bring the best types of innovation to the state. So I would love to talk to uh, any of you here one-on-one -on, -one on all those great initiatives. Next one. So again, um, leading technology in Colorado, it's awesome. The stats are mind-blowing, right? First, fastest growing economy. Second best state to start a business. And with our Google platform, we know, like uh, we track all of this. Second top state for high-tech share of all businesses, entrepreneurship, and um, high-tech employment. I think we had a goal of 25,000 tech jobs by the end of this year, and we, we are already at 20,000 jobs. So that's amazing work in that space. Again, these were the public-private partnerships that I talked about. And we do a lot of, uh, my chief strategy officer, uh, she and I, we go out and to universities. Um, we were at Stanford and Harvard just uh, this past month, where we want to tie up with um, their talent pipelines for the upcoming workforce, right? Um, we have a lot of retirements at the state, so we need to fill that gap very quickly. And the best, fastest way for us is to partnership, uh, do, do a complete number of partnerships with the university system. So we're very closely aligned um, with CU, CSU, and uh, other universities across the nation. Again, the stats speak for themselves. As I mentioned, we had a goal of 25,000, and we've met that already. And 118 startups in 2013, a very vibrant economic um, growth nation. I mean, this is like, um, as a, a Colorado, we should be very, very proud. Again, if anybody is interested in getting some resources, and I can help so broker some of those conversations if you're interested uh, with CTA, with Startup Colorado, uh, COIN, um, I'm a board member of COIN too, um, small businesses, um, Rockies Venture Club, and various other uh, resources. So. As an entrepreneur, don't think you're there by yourself. There's a lot of resources. I wish I had the access, our family had the access when we were entrepreneurs because we didn't even know where to start. So um, it's a different climate altogether now. Questions? And again, I wanted to do, thank my team. Debbie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, she's the CISO for the state of Colorado, and she has just about $600,000 uh, 600, malicious attacks a day. So she's a very, very busy woman. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs> you see the trajectory of Colorado technology in terms of going global with exports. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, in your role as Secretary of Technology, what trajectory do you see for Colorado in terms of the export of technology overseas? Again, as I mentioned, the very fact that I have the role of Secretary of Technology just shows how much importance we are giving to technology in the state. Um, we, it, we are partnering with all major firms across the uh, uh, globe. So we want to make sure that we, we are in that place, but we haven't had um, a lot of momentum just yet. But my focus is to have that uh, conversations take, go to that next level. We are just in the beginning stages of um, those kinds of you know, technology exports. What can we do at a global level? So they're, they're happening, but uh, we don't have goals defined just yet. But that's my plan within the next year, is to make sure that we have a complete roadmap established for um, that kind of a conversation. 
lot of incentives yes. from state of Colorado for exporting technology uh, to the rest of the world. Yep. Uh, there is a department that you can go to, and they will give you all the guidelines on how to do that. Um, Thank you, actually, sir. one of my friends was the first secretary of technology for Colorado, and he tried to get that stuff going 10 years ago, and it's still not going. Uh, we took a, a company in just to test the OEdit and see what they had, mm -hmm. uh, what their capabilities really were, because you hear a lot of talk about how everybody wants to do things, but when the rubber hits the road on the government side, it often falls off because it's hard to coordinate when you're trying to run the government, too. So it's not a criticism, it's okay. an observation. But the... Uh, uh, OEDA had nothing for, uh, in terms of any tangible benefits available to a company to manufacture environmental instruments for air pollution and pass data systems to sell to China and to what was at that time going to be a very hot market. I mean, they really just, I, I gave them everything they could possibly want. I've got a long background in global business and doing, and, you know, done infrastructure, uh, consulting in India and products in China and you know, selling mm -hmm. to various other markets and we need I think a full time team of people to work on globalizing these companies because this is uh, all like the anxious medical campus we've got all that medical information mm -hmm. technology out there. Right. All that was built in printed tax dollars we don't export out of there and that's a net negative or just we're not breaking even on right. um, The Office of Economic Development again uh, it, it I don't know when this happened, but four years ago, um, it was under Ken Lund, who just retired from the ED's position there. Um, but again, in the past few months that I've been at the state, it's a different dynamic right now. They are taking that um, international global stuff very seriously, right? We can be just this uh, great state within the Midwest. We truly need to make ourselves global. Um, and I think, again, partnerships with Israel are the security company in Israel, and there's a big conversation going on with them on how we can have this uh, economic uh, tangible, to your point, right? Um, and making sure that we are tracking that and we are publishing that. So there's a tremendous amount of work underway. And as I mentioned, again, within the next year, um, Fiona is the new executive director of uh, Office of Economic Development now. And she um, is totally energized by this goal, and we want to make this a more tangible result uh, going forward. Could you talk a little bit more about the Google Drive plat or the Google platform? Is it Google Drive or what are you doing with Google? Uh, Google everything. So <laughs> <laughs> um, we have the complete office productivity suite. So we moved away from 15 different disparate email systems to one Google platform in the office space. Uh, we use collaboration, Google Hangouts, Google Drive, Google Share, all of that. Um, it's almost a 95% Google platform within the state of Colorado. There's a few agencies that are still on Office 365 and other platforms, but it's a, a very robust Google platform. It happened over a period of two to three years. And so again, Google takes us very seriously because we, um, and there's again a lot of integration with um, Excel and Microsoft Word from within Google. And uh, we are working with Salesforce.com now to authenticate uh, the security around Google, too, and make it all integrated. So it's a lot of innovation happening right around that space. People didn't like Google. I can be very upfront here. Um, but now they embrace it. And uh, we are, we are saying, uh, saving a ton of money using Google Hangouts um, instead of every meeting being in person. I was uh, invited to participate in the Go Code Colorado brainstorming last week, and it was a really eye-opening experience because I've never lived someplace before where there was such a really open collaboration between the state government and the business community. It was really refreshing, really incredible, and um, and it's made it very clear that that our success as a business community and your success in the State Department are, um, you know, we're, we've got a relationship there. What can this community be doing to better support what you guys are trying to do? I worked in the private industry, private sector for a really long time and it was a very pleasant surprise on how much is going on at the state and how uh, willing and open they are 
to receive ideas, to uh, partner, to make sure that we are on the right track, right? Uh, so Go Code Colorado is one of that. Uh, we had one called GovDev Challenge where, uh, again, you know, a $25,000 award for that business to come set uh, whatever solution they ca came up with and make it uh, uh, on a path of implementation, right? So it was, um, for me, it was eye-opening as well. And please, with Ty, I would love for you to uh, come forward with more ideas, and I would love to partner with you. Um, there's a lot of great leaders within this room, and Vic knows everyone. So, <laughs> um, so please, um, I'm looking forward to a very rewarding, mutually rewarding partnership with Ty. And again, the community, the ecosystem that we've built is what's going to sustain that kind of momentum. Sorry. Thank you so much for sharing. My name is Vincent Omegba. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, my little girl, as I was taking her to school, I told her you were speaking here today and she couldn't come with me because she has to be in class. But she said to say hello to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I brought her here about 10 years ago when she was four years old. She has scholarship and she goes to Kent Denver School. Yes, uh, right around school, the corner. By the yeah. Way. yeah. So uh, the uh, gentleman there spoke about how to export technology to other parts of the mm -hmm. world. And uh, I represent the African group here in Colorado. And uh, there are a lot of immigrants from Africa who are very technologically driven, and, but they don't have access to. Uh, to venture capitalists and people who can help them to tweak their ideas and to get them to get to that level of, uh, uh, to be able to be more productive. Is there any program that you have for uh, immigrants, or people who are here, who, who are here legally? Right. <laughs> 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 and who want to get into this huge resources that we have in Colorado? Great question. Thank you for that. Um, again, as I mentioned, I'm so honored to be part of uh, Governor Hickenlooper's administration. I'm the very first Asian Indian woman to be on his cabinet. So for me, the very fact that, again, I didn't have any connections at the cabinet level, I didn't have any um, place there I could get help. It was truly based on my merit and my hard work. And, but that administration is open to people with having that extremely great background in terms of you know, technology background, science, whatever, um, and having that um, sincere uh, efforts to make it big, right? So that's the kind of administration. I can, I can tell vehemently that they are absolutely open in terms of how to help every uh, immigrant, right? And, um, I would always encourage you to come and uh, to one of the Office of Economic Development forums or uh, CTA if you're in the technology uh, space and uh, SBDC. All these organizations that I've listed, um, they're great resources and feel free to reach out to me. Um, I, uh, Monica Coughlin on my um, office is dedicated to bringing these innovation ideas together. So um, would love to talk to you and see how we can partner. If there's a business idea or a business um, uh, organization that we can help. Because again, it's all about that first client. Yes. To address your, excuse me, to address your Thai Rockies is a chapter of Thai Global. Thai Global is the largest organization in the world with the mission of supporting the entrepreneur. That's our mission. Thai Global was started by Indian technologists. It is the largest, most multicultural, most diverse entrepreneurial organization on earth. We have all the resources here for someone that's trying to start something like this, and we're well respected in the neighborhood, so to speak. I heard Sam Kumar, one of our board members here this morning, who owns New Cloud Networks, by the way, um, a boutique cloud service provider, plug for Sam. And Vic Ahmed <laughs> been talking to Suma about possibly in the future, possibly for being a board member of the organization. So that's the kind of organization. I'm nominating her. Uh, All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Again, um, just a few facts on diversity, right? Um, 
my ELT, my, um, what's the ELT? Executive, Executive leadership, leadership team. <laughs> I call them ELT all the time. So they are 77% women. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> and um, again, diversity is, again, I come from a different background, and this state has embraced me like no other. It's, it's family. Um, I can't speak about New York and other, other uh, states, but Colorado is such an open climate. I mean, you can but l smile while you're looking at the mountains. So it's, it's all about you know, clouds and butterflies here. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a super glamorous agenda, right? And it's very intentional for that reason. Um, it's back to basics. Back to basics means um, for us, as, our, uh, as we serve our departments and agencies, we want to ensure that we are doing it with a service excellence that's unparalleled anywhere else. So we um, want to make sure that our applications are robust, and the application sprawl is contained. Our infrastructure is very robust with no single points of failure, right? We have a network redundancy that's built into everything. We have a disaster recovery plan. We have a business continuity plan with everything we do. Um, and we are a cloud first strategy. So we want to ensure that our strategy is translated into actionable uh, items for our agencies. So, um, and then Secure Colorado, which is very important to us, we've in implemented the first five standards of the NIST controls. Now we want to implement the next five. So again, it's basically um, around making sure that our foundational pieces are rock solid um, before we take on bigger um, innovation strategies. And innovation is in everything we do rather than something on its own. So our playbook is very simple, but it it will deliver. I can tell you with the team that I have in place that we will deliver on every single of those initiatives. And uh, one of them is attracting more jobs to Colorado. So, does that answer your question? I'll look forward to getting into more details. Yes. <laughs> so, you mentioned the NIST strategy that you were rolling out with respect to security. I'm in cybersecurity, and the issue is always, you know, what is the support at the top level, okay? And with you guys, I mean, I see the support at the administration level, but the CFO for you, I guess, is the legislature, uh, where you get your money. Yes. What is the understanding, what is your take of the legislature, its understanding of cybersecurity and the importance of protecting the assets of the people of the state of Colorado and their willingness to support you with money to get your job done. This might be from Deborah. also, yeah. uh, this question. Um, the legislature and the administration take security very seriously, right? Uh, the cost of not doing that is going to be more, um, and we will all be on the front page of the Denver Post, which we don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we put security on top of everything, and it gets approved. Just kidding, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, they take it seriously, and uh, for we have the budget now in place for both uh, FI 15 and 16 for making sure that we execute on, on all the controls uh, that we put forward that we can, uh, as goals for us. Uh, Debbie, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. So I would add um, that really talking to the legislature is somewhat like talking to a board of directors, that um, you have to educate them. And fortunately, we do have a few individuals on the legislature who understand cybersecurity and who are technologists. And so they're like anyone else. You come to them with a well-thought-out strategic plan, and they're very willing to embrace that, very interested in that. So I would say, you know, I can't take the credit. My predecessor did a phenomenal job of building that strategic plan and then taking it to them and educating them, bringing that level of education up to be able to, um, so that they could understand why we need to make those strategic investments. We didn't find a strategic place for this too. <laughs> um, a little bit more of a personal question. Uh, when you made the jump from private to public sector, you just, I don't know, talk about your biggest challenges or the biggest differences. Um, great question. The biggest challenge was funding. <laughs> so uh, we are 100% appropriated, so um, it's 
hard sometimes because it's taxpayers' money, and we are very frugal about it. But um, sometimes with our innovation projects, we have to do a very good marketing and selling job of our vision uh, because they're like it's not immediately translated into something for them right away, right? So we have to put our hats on as a business owner and explain to them uh, in their terms. Um, so that's been a challenge. Um, other public sector stuff, when systems go down in the private sector, you're like, okay, you work on it and stuff. But here, you get calls from the Denver Post, Fox News, and they're like, what's going on? Yeah. So it's <laughs> a lot of pressure, <laughs> a lot of visibility sometimes, right? Um, so those were a few challenges. And for me, the media was a big um, unknown going in, right? So. Um, but again, they're, they're very supportive and they, they want the right things for the citizens of Colorado and that's where they're coming from. And it's good to have those uh, checks and balances, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, and there's literally no downtime because when our systems go down, it truly impacts um, food stamps, it impacts homelessness, it impacts uh, single moms, right? So we have to take our jobs very seriously and we do. Um, it, it just adds up stress to you because you, you want things to be up, but um, the funding is not there to have like redundant systems everywhere, right? So um, we work very, very hard and we have a very busy schedule. And I thought again, public sector maybe not so much, you know, busy, but it's extremely busy. It's almost 24 by 7. So that was a big surprise. And there was a question. So in your current role, I mean, you just spoke about goals and playbook and, and such. Uh, could you shed some more light on your top priority or priorities? What keeps you and your team up at night? Again, ha eliminating those single points of failure across the enterprise. Okay. Be it in terms of um, infrastructure, network, or people, right? Uh, there are systems which are like several uh, decades old, but there's only one person supporting it. So that's what keeps us at, up at night is like, what if that person retires and we don't even, and they're so busy just keeping the lights on, they don't have time for a transition plan. So those are the things that keep us up at night. So we want to eliminate the single points of failure across the enterprise in terms of everything that touches a, a citizen and also make sure that we have good documentation in place, we have good processes in place so that we, we eliminate those, right? So, um, and again, for us, the biggest initiative is Back to Basics, where we excel in our service to our agencies, and they don't look at IT as a roadblock, and we are seen as <coughs> orchestrators and enable, enablers of their services. That's our biggest goal. So what technological growth areas do you forecast for Colorado? Um, I don't see any technological barriers at all uh, because, again, as I mentioned, the biggest buzzwords around the industry right now, social, mobile, analytics, cloud, security, we have those foundational pieces already in place. And um, as I mentioned, the a state of, uh, a vibrant state of economy and innovation, we're always looking uh, and partnering with our private firms to uh, get on to the latest and greatest, again, not just for the sake of technology, um, but the, the biggest thing is funding. That's more than the technology, it's the funding. And we have to take care of our tax dollars very judiciously, that's all. So about several years ago, I was a, a private sector commissioner on the Information Management Commission. At that time, we had over 20 some CIOs in each agency, everything was very disparate, and we were starting the process to move to the enterprise architecture. Mm -hmm. So as a taxpayer, I'm curious as to your assessment of where we're at today in terms of you having, uh, as a CIO of the state, having an enterprise architecture and being able to get agency value on that? Great question. Uh, one, one of the very few states in the nation to have gone through this consolidation, right? So when I go to like NACIO and other uh, North American state um, CIO summit, they're like, oh wow, how did you guys do that, right? Um, we have achieved $39 million uh, from whenever it was consolidated to now. And just this year alone with cost savings or uh, cost avoidance, we have achieved $3.9 million. So that's a lot. Again, you get so much economies of scale when you consolidate. And um, the CIOs that were in each agency are now IT directors. So that helps a lot with the knowledge transition and you know, having that embedded uh, legacy knowledge of the department. So that's been very, very effective. Um, are the agencies happy with the consolidation? Most of them are. 
not all of them. <laughs> so, you can just like, where are my three people? You know, you took them away. So I get some of those questions all the time. But um, I think if we excel at our service uh, even more, they will tend to um, not focus so much on their employees and how it was in the past, right? And they get to see the shared services efficiencies. Um, so it's, it's an interesting challenge, but I think we've moved on beyond the big barriers. Um, again, having an enterprise office productivity suite or collaboration suite, having a secure Colorado, which is across the agencies, um, those enterprise level initiatives are working very, very well. And they like that. And the phones, and uh, we work with Cisco, we have, um, you know, uh, microwave towers uh, that again we manage for the entire state. Uh, so all those efficiencies they like, but there's line of business applications that they still want to have control over. So, especially uh, some departments which I would name. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess. <laughs> but again, um, the new um, leadership they've embraced it, so I'm very grateful to them for their support and they want it to be successful in a consolidated manner. Hi, uh, I'm Alvaro Espinosa, a uh, uh, legal resident of uh, Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I'm one of the few Mexicans that is legal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I can demonstrate that. But I've been working all my life in uh, sourcing, like I do uh, um, uh, manufacturing in, actually in, a in Asia, Mexico, uh, in, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, except India, mm -hmm. one of my biggest gaps. But uh, my question is more about, uh, so we launch products. So if somebody comes to us and says, okay, we have this gadget and we want to produce, mass produce this, we have design people, we have orders us to take it from from uh, an idea, from a napkin, mm -hmm. to full production, mass production, international and, and global markets. So that's what we do right now. But one of the main, main things is for us, is outsourcing. So IT is one of the more, let's say, typical um, areas where you as a government, mm -hmm. you want to be slim, mm -hmm. right? Or lean. Uh, that's the goal. Well, some, mm -hmm. some people. So, so how often are you are to really go and outsource some of your areas where there is a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that can do that service mm -hmm. and make it very efficient and leverage and do a scale economies and social yeah. <coughs> Um, so have, uh, I have an extensive background in outsourcing. Um, at Catholic Health Initiatives, they outsourced around 800 jobs to a company in India. And it was a very rocky transition, right? Um, especially because we were in a healthcare setting and they wanted the, to do their very best, but they didn't have the intrinsic knowledge that goes on within a hospital network, right? So, and Again, when I was working in Teletech, it was outsourced to 19 countries. We had call centers in 19 countries, right? Very effective way, because that's the best way to go reach out to your consumers and citizens and um, uh, businesses within that country. So I, I worked a lot with Teletech Mexico, Philippines, Argentina, um, and again, all the technology companies like Oracle, EMC, they all have operations in India and everywhere else, right? So outsourcing can work, but it has to be managed. It has to be done with a lot of maturity, and you need to have solid business plans in place on what they're going to do, what you're going to do, all of that. Um, so it depends on the organization and how uh, well they uh, plan it out and how well they execute on that plan. Do you have any plans on your... I, <laughs> this is, I'll be in big trouble, no. <laughs> no outsourcing. <laughs> no, um, we can't outsource jobs outside of the state, right? And again, my plan is to attract more jobs to to Colorado. So it's a different uh, initiative for me because coming in the private sector, they're like lean, mean, you know, cost savings. Uh, it's a different paradigm in uh, the state. We can't outsource, um, but there's absolutely places where we have to be efficient in terms of resources. We can't throw 20 bodies at a problem. We have to have business process re-engineering. We have to have uh, solid, um, you know, people in place and all of that. So. Um, we we can partner <coughs> with your organizations and organization like yours, but uh, it can be an outsource indeed. In that sense. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> wow, tough questions. <laughs> 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 um, 
can you talk about uh, what platform your developers are using? I don't know if you use Google in addition to all their productivity and stuff, but just interested in the applications you're developing going forward. Um, are, are you all consolidating on a centralized development platform? Yes. So um, we have 1,200 plus applications, um, which are again range from COBOL, Informix, uh, Oracle, PLSQL, uh, to Salesforce, right? So we have every flavor of everything. And I'm going to add this to my resume. We have even cattle branding applications. I <laughs> 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 never worked in those. So. <laughs> um, it's so great coming into the state because you truly, if you want to be an Oracle PLSQL program, you can truly be that. And if you want to be a Salesforce, um, developer, you can be that, right? Um, so our plan is to consolidate and strategize into meaningful um, solutions for the state going forward using, again, our cloud-first, mobile-first um, strategies. Because our data centers are getting oversaturated right now, uh, we can continue to do that. Um, so we are looking at cloud first for almost everything on a go-forward basis. That could be Salesforce, that could be in um, Drupal. I never heard about that until last week when something failed. Um, so we, we want to consolidate and come to a, an enterprise type platform for uh, solutions going forward. We've just replaced our financial system, which was 22 years old. Uh, it was called Coffers. We don't even know the programming language behind that. Um, and now it's uh, into a, a multi-tenant cloud-based solution by uh, HCL, right? CGI, you get confused. <laughs> so. Typically, in a cloud-based uh, uh, <clears throat> endeavor, you mentioned cloud first, that would be the state. I mean, one of the goals is a reduced IT headcount mm -hmm. over time, right? So can you give us an idea in terms of the state of Colorado, where you were in IT headcount three years ago and where you are now and how that's going? It goes back to that question of consolidation, right? So we have received people from various departments, you know, the IT programmers and network people that were in various departments and consolidated, and that's how the consolidation happened. Um, the businesses uh, have grown, like Department of Revenue, Department of Transportation. So my organization right now is around 900 people. Um, so we support 28,000 state employees. Cloud first, we are just migrating our solutions into the cloud. Um, especially Department of uh, Human Services, CDHS. Um, there will be some efficiencies, and that's the reason why we want to go to the cloud along with security and uh, other considerations, but um, we want to train our workforce to be these orchestrators of technology instead of the builders of technology, right? So it's not that we're going to lay people off or not hire people, it's going to be a totally different skill set. So I don't think there's going to be a one-to-one -one replacement of, you know, okay, you have five developers, um, you don't need five developers because you go into the cloud. It's, it's a different equation. And that's how I'm trying to keep the jobs um, and retrain these people in the latest technologies. So you're trying to keep the jobs but increase productivity? Yes. Yeah. What a concept, right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially with government <laughs> services, so. <laughs> From the state's perspective, um, a lot of the systems that you see or hear about and read and a little bit of background is that the systems are very you know, older, archaic. They're, they're not designed to communicate with the other systems in the state, and I think sometimes they piecemeal them, or at least they don't have a, a, a concept of looking at the overall architecture to make sure they all are integrated, look at it from that high-level perspective. So just saying, I'm going to do this one piece, I got a budget for this one area, and then they have a system that doesn't really fulfill what it needs to do. So I'm assuming that's kind of, you, you've got an impressive background from the private sector and some complex systems you've integrated and worked together, and I guess that's a lot of what you're looking to do as you Absolutely. put your plans together to make yes. these systems more, you know, more cloud-based, more futuristic, yes. and, and they work and talk together, and they don't go over budget. Uh, my goal and plan is to, again, consolidate these 1,200 applications into a more workable um, roadmap. And then, I mean, we are all in, in parallel, we are working on enterprise standards, publishing them, documenting them, and making sure that people are adhering to that, because that's a big problem. Um, a lot of the times, agencies go and talk to a vendor, and they get super excited, and let's build it, right? And then we're like, what's going on? <laughs> so the typical challenges. We are trying to get away from that, and the government is behind uh, me to support that, saying include us in conversations up front, uh, include us in, a, in your strategic decisions, and not after the fact. 
So that way, it fits within that enterprise model. And funding, too, is going to be an enterprise model. And I'll give you an example. Department of Agriculture wanted to do um, a Salesforce implementation. But if we expanded that, we could have done that. Um, we would be doing that for a lot more organizations with that basic framework in place, right? So that's the kind of conversations <coughs> we're having, right? If you have a need, how can we scale that? And how can we talk about scope and all of that within a bigger framework? So uh, a lot of those conversations are happening. And that's uh, why the governor hired me, is to bring that kind of um, efficiencies to the table <coughs> in terms of enterprise architecture. We have time for one more question. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much.